Hello again. Here we are. This is the video for the heat content of food labs. I'm going to walk you through what we would usually be doing in the lab. There's a couple of videos. And then after viewing the videos and listening to this, you will be able to answer a series of questions. So here we go. How do we find out the caloric value of foods like a Big Mac, but not that you would eat that though? Make sure you start out with understanding some definitions. I know Dr. Thompson has talked about the definition of a calorie. Just make sure that you know what it is. The official scientific definition of a calorie is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. You can imagine on an upcoming lab exam, a question asking which of the following is a definition of a calorie you should be able to pick this out of a list. The amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. If we look at a calorie in simpler terms, we can simply say it's the amount of heat given off. In this case, we're talking about food. So it's the amount of heat given off by food. Make sure you review both definitions, okay? I like to give a second definition so we can talk about it in more simpler terms in this lab. So if we were to compare, for example, a Big Mac, not that you would ever eat that, and some delicious grilled asparagus with garlic. I mean, I would definitely choose the asparagus. If we were gonna measure the caloric content of these different foods, we would be measuring the amount of heat given off by these foods once they are broken down by our body. I'm going to say that again. You take some bites of the Big Mac. I, or maybe you, take some bites of the asparagus. We already had this lab, the, the digestive lab. We bring in food. We have to mechanically digest it, chemically digest it, and then it can be absorbed. So in the process, after we bring in that food, in the process of digesting it and then absorbing it, that certain food gives off an amount of heat. So let's say that the Big Mac, when we bring in those food contents and we digest it, a Big Mac gives off a lot of heat. It does. And what that means is the more heat a food gives off in our body, the more calories it contains. Versus if you ingest some asparagus, it's gonna give off less heat in your body once it's digested and absorbed, and therefore contains less calories. So we can simplify it by saying a calorie in terms of food is the amount of heat given off by that food in our body. Now, my question to you is, what does our body do with that heat? And in the case of almost all the nutrients, except for protein in, in large instances, the carbs and the fat particularly, what does our body do with that heat? Uses it for energy. Heat is a form of energy. So we're able to convert the energy from these foods into energy our body can use. And of course, when I'm talking about energy our body can use, I'm talking about ATP. This is a really important connection. You know, everyone hears about calories. You're gonna be hearing me talk about how many calories is in a Big Mac, 560 some calories, which is probably over a quarter of what most of us need in a day just in one sandwich. And it's easy just to throw it off as calories. What does that mean? But let's keep it simple. Calories refer, in this case, to the amount of heat given off by a food. The more heat a food gives off, the more calories it contains. And what does our body, in turn, do with those calories? They convert it to a form of heat that they can use as energy. So theoretically, the more calories a food has, the more energy it can provide us. And while that's true, the type of calories matter. So not to say that a Big Mac is always the best choice.
All right, good stuff. Make sure that you know the difference between a thermal calorie and a nutritive calorie. These definitions are in your lab book. They're written here too. A thermal calorie is a lowercase c and it's used by scientists, whereas the lay term that you're used to and we're going to use for this lab would be a nutritive calorie, and that is identified by an uppercase c. So when I look at the McDonald's Big Mac, I was wrong. I said 560 calories, actually 590 woo, from one sandwich. This is what we're talking about. So when we talk about nutritive calorie, this is what we're referring to when we look at labels. Just a side note here, nutritive calories are often used interchangeably with kilocalorie. So it's not a big deal, but I just want you to know that if that said, what, 590 calories, 590 kilocalories, we're going to use these interchangeably, meaning the same thing. As I said, thermal calories are the form used by scientists, so we're not going to worry about that. I gave you some example if one serving of asparagus contains about 25 calories, which it does, um, 25 nutritive calories or kilocalories would actually be 25,000 thermal calories. But we're going to stick to the nutritive calorie and the kilocalorie. And in our circumstance, they're going to be interchangeable. All right, so let's get to the crux of this lab. How can we measure the amount of calories in a food? Well, we use a process called indirect calorimetry. And I know Dr. Thompson has talked about this in lecture. In indirect calorimetry, to measure the heat content of foods, you have a setup where you burn a food sample, and through burning that food sample and trying to estimate how much heat it gives off, you can put how much heat it gives off into an equation and estimate the number of calories that food contains. In lab, in this lab, in person, we would be using both of these. Because we're not in person, I've got videos that show you the use of both of these. We use, and this is what students typically have fun with, and I'm sorry you can't do it because it is pretty fun, a homemade calorimeter, which is up top here, the picture on the top right. And then we do, right beside our lab, have the fancy, fancy bomb calorimeter, and it looks just like the picture on the bottom right. Let's talk about how each of these work works. I'm going to start with the bomb calorimeter. So the one we have in lab looks like the picture on the bottom. So the one we have in lab looks like this. But I like this other picture because it shows you what's really going on outside. So what we can, er, excuse me, inside, we can see what's going on inside. What you can see here is we have our food sample. So in this lab, we're going to burn a peanut, popcorn, and a potato chip. So you put your food sample right there. Their food sample is yellow, okay? You put your food sample in this sealed container. And that sealed container is typically called the bomb, hence the word bomb calorimeter. And surrounding that sealed container with the food sample is water. And this is why it's indirect. Because what happens is we ignite the food sample inside that sealed chamber. You press a button on the unit, and even though you can't see it, it ignites the food. And let me change colors, because I think that'll be fun. Let's go to red to demonstrate fire. When that food sample is burned, it's going to give off heat. And that heat is going to change the temperature of the water surrounding the food. This is why it's called indirect, because we're actually measuring the temperature change of the water surrounding the food. It's really not possible for us to directly measure the heat coming off of that food. So instead, to make sure that we capture as much of that heat as we can, we use water as a medium. So we have a starting temperature of the water, 
We burn the food, the food gives off heat, and that heat increases the temperature of the water surrounding the chamber. And then we have a final temperature. Okay? So we're measuring the temperature of the water outside of the sealed chamber. I'm going to let you think about ways in which this method is so accurate. You'll get some tips with that when you watch the video in a little bit. How is our homemade calorimeter going to work? Well, it's the same principles, but we're not gonna be using a $10,000 piece of equipment. So in the lab, and there's a video coming up, you would be putting a food sample. Here's a very nice picture of a peanut, right? Here's the peanut. And we have it in like a Folgers coffee cup can. If you're old enough to know old fashioned Folgers can, aluminum can. And hanging over that Folgers can is a smaller tomato paste can filled with water. So the idea is the same. Let me change color again. Let me use blue. The idea is the same. We're gonna put a lighter into the food sample and it's gonna burn. And as it burns, that burning food gives off heat. In this case, we're gonna measure the temperature change of the water in this can. We'll have an initial change, uh, excuse me, we'll have an initial temperature of that water, and then we will have a final temperature of that water. And from that, plug it into an equation, we'll be able to estimate the number of calories that food contains. Looking at this and hearing the explanation, you should be able to come up with some ideas about what makes this homemade calorimeter less accurate than the bomb calorimeter. Okay, now that we've introduced the homemade calorimeter and the bomb calorimeter, I'd like you to make some hypotheses. So as I said, we're gonna be measuring the heat content of three food samples. We have popcorn, a potato chip, and a peanut. So right now, I'd like you to somewhere jot down which of these three foods you believe will give off the most heat. And remember, whatever food gives off the most heat in the form of calories will contain the most number of calories. I'd like you to also hypothesize which of these three foods you think, when we burn it, will give off the least amount of heat and will therefore contain the least amount of calories. All right, if you need to pause the video, pause the video. I really want you to make some hypotheses and we're gonna see if you're right. All right, so instead of doing this in person, I recorded a video of me um, creating the homemade calorimeter. I'm gonna hit the video link in a minute so we can watch it together. And then I also want you to know that I will post this link um, in Blackboard. So if you'd like to see it again, you'll be able to have the link. So here we are on the homemade calorimeter. Hello, Soccer Jenkins, we're here for the what happens? Oh, excuse me. See? Not really that good with YouTube, but I wanted to hit the... Burning up some food. I'm a little bit sad that you don't have the chance to do this in lab, but not to worry. At La Casa, Dave Dr. Jenkins, we have the setup right here for you. Okay? We're going to be burning a piece of popcorn, a potato chip, and a peanut. As we know, calories are a unit of heat. So we're going to measure how much heat comes off of each food, do a calculation, and that will tell us and ask them how many calories are in each food. Before we started this, we did, I'll come to you, don't you worry, we did some, hey there, we did some hypotheses, right? So I asked my trusty assistant, I asked her which of the three foods she thought would contain the most calories. She thought potato chip. You think what you think will contain the most calories, the chip, popcorn, or peanut. Also, I'd like you to make a hypothesis for which piece of food will contain the least amount. My trusty assistant thought it was the popcorn. 
Do you think she's right? We're going to find out. All right. Before we begin this, we're going to be going right from the instructions in the lab book. We're going to be weighing each food sample on a trusty scale. And you know Dr. Jenkins has a food scale at her house. She sure does. We're going to take a baseline weight of each of our foods. I've put together the same table that's in your lab book. Because from these numbers, you're going to do the calculations. I put this on the scale. I press zero to tear it. We're going to put on, that's not going to work. We're going to put on the popcorn. 0.22 grams. So I'm going to write in the initial popcorn weight, 0.22 grams. Potato chip. And then I'm going to zero it. Potato chip. 0.41 grams. Science, and what other lab are they going to be burning up food? Not any cool ones. Now we'll do the peanut. 0.53 grams. So we have the initial food weights. After we burn the food, we're going to weigh them again to get the final weights, and then we're going to take the difference. Are you ready? I'm ready. We're going to be creating our homemade calorimeter. Now in this lab, we're also going to be talking about the bomb calorimeter, which is the most accurate way to measure calories. But that costs about $10,000. Not too many people have that. I mean, we do, but not too many people have it. But we can also do a homemade one, all right? To do that, we have a big, like, Folgers coffee can. We have a smaller tomato paste can. Here we go. We have our little foil piece with a wire coming out the top. Let's do the popcorn first. So I'm going to arrange the wire. It's kind of hard to see. I'm going to arrange the wire so it will cradle the piece of popcorn. I'm excited. So we're going to put this right down. Now I've already weighed it. Okay. We're going to put this can over top. Dangling over top of this, we're going to take a small tomato paste can with 100 mils of warm water. Dr. Jenkins also has a beaker in her house. This is why she has no nightlife. Before we do this, we're going to take the temperature in degrees Celsius. So in addition to getting a beginning weight and an end weight, we need a beginning temperature of this and an end temperature of this. Thirty degree. Oh, oh, thirty-one. There it goes. Look at the fun you're missing doing the lab person. I'm gonna let it rise for a minute. As that's rising, let's think about what are gonna be some of the ways that our homemade calorimeter is not as accurate as the bomb calorimeter. This is the part where in the lab when I ask a question, there's an awkward silence. I won't tell you the answer, but I want you to start thinking about what are going to be some ways in which this is not as accurate. All right, we are at 33 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to put initial temperature, 33 degrees Celsius. Ready to burn some stuff? I'm ready to burn some stuff. So we're going to pour this into the tomato paste can.
Be rested on the table. Yeah, so I'm gonna put this in the porthole and I'm gonna light the piece of popcorn on fire. Can you get a view of the top? Is it burning? Ring it up, ring it up. It is burning and it smells like burning popcorn. It smells like science, ladies and gentlemen. Could you go back around? Perfect. So what I'm gonna do is, is after it's done burning, immediately after, I'm gonna take this off and retake the temperature. You're gonna notice when I put the thermometer in here, I don't want the thermometer to touch the bottom of the tomato paste can, because that's gonna increase the temperature abnormally. Let this go up a little bit. So far, it seems to have not gone up that much. Our initial temperature was 33 degrees Celsius. Now it's 34 degrees Celsius. So I'm gonna put it in here, 34 degrees Celsius. And then we're gonna do a wait. So if I take this off, we're gonna see what's left. I'll bring it over to you. That's what's left of the peanut piece, or excuse me, the popcorn piece. I'm gonna put it back on the scale. Let me first tear it. Put the weighing bone on there. Press the zero to tear it. Put this on there. Our initial weight was 0 0.22 grams. Our weight now is 0.2 grams. Now we're gonna pause for a second while we set up the remaining burning parts. Okay, everyone, now we're back for the equations. This is a super close look at me. Whoa. So I gave you the data, and I'm going to give it to you in the next video, okay? In order to calculate, I'm going to do the popcorn as an example, and you're going to do the rest of the chip and the peanut. For the weight, you take the initial and the final, and you subtract. So our initial popcorn weight was 0.22 grams. Our final weight was 0.2 grams. So the difference is... 0.02 grams. We do the same thing. We do the same thing for the temperature. It went from 33 to 34. So that's a plus one degree Celsius increase. Now we're going to plug these numbers into these equations. These are the same equations that are in your book. Okay? I'm just going to show you how to do it once, and you do the rest. For the popcorn, we've got three equations for each piece of food. You're first going to do heat absorbed. In the lab book, it tells you take 100 mils times the temperature change. So for our popcorn, the temperature change was 1. So I will simply do 100 mils times 1 times 1 equals 100. Okay, so 100 mils times the temperature change times 1 equals 100. Now I'm going to do a number of nutritive calories. So I take the number of thermal calories, which is 100, and I divide by 1,000. You don't even need a calculator for this. If we were in lab and you used a calculator to do this, I would have something to say about it. Because all we have to do is move the decimal. So 100 divided by 1,000, I take the decimal over 1, 2, 3 times. So it would be 0.1. So 
So our nutritive calories for the popcorn is 0.1. And like I talked about in the beginning of this series, the thermal calorie has a lowercase c, and the nutritive calorie has a capital C. The last calculation is the amount of calories per gram. This is what we really care about. We take the number of thermal calories, which is 100, divide by the difference in weight. What was the difference in weight for our popcorn? 0 0.02. And then we're going to divide the whole thing by 1,000. This one I will need the calculator for, but it won't take you very long, so I will do 100. Divided by 0.2 equals, and then divide that by 1,000. 0.5 calories per gram. Let me just show you this. 0.5 calories per gram. So you do the same thing for the chip and the popcorn, and we'll see what happens. Okay, everyone, now we're back. All right, so using the data that I found out in the video, you can see I filled in all of the information. So you can see not only for the popcorn, but I filled in the initial and final weights for the chip and the peanut, and the initial and final temperatures for the chip and peanut. So before we go on, right now, you can jot down the differences in the weight of the chip and peanut and the differences in the temperature. You can pause the video if you need to. And then you're going to go ahead and do the same calculations that I did. So I've just given you the same thing I did in the video. And what we found out in the video was that the popcorn had 0.5 calories per gram. Oh, it wasn't on there, 0.5 calories per gram. You're gonna do the same thing for the potato chip and the same thing for the peanut. And once you do that, you're gonna be able to fill in table two. I wanna make sure we're clear. I'm focusing on the number of calories per gram. And the reason we're doing that is because it didn't matter what our initial weight was. You may recall our initial weights were all different. The popcorn was 0.22 grams. The peanut was 0.5 something grams. So the way that we can compare all three, regardless of them being different weights, is we're able to calculate number of calories per gram. So what this is telling us for the popcorn is for every one gram of popcorn, there are... 0.5 calories. And we're going to get the same values per gram. And this, this enables us to compare the three, even though they had different weights to start with and finish with. All right, so you can fill in the number of calories per gram for the homemade calorimeter for the potato chip and the peanut using the equations on the previous slides. And I'm going to post this slide on Blackboard so you can go go refer to those if you need. Of course, eventually we're going to compare these homemade calorimeter values to the bomb calorimeter values. Speaking of the bomb calorimeter, here we go. We just did the homemade calorimeter. Now let's talk about the bomb calorimeter. If we were on campus, I would go back to the little lab prep room and I would show you as a demonstration how this works. I found a video that explains, and a short video explains the bomb calorimeter pretty well. There are some differences between the one in the video and the one that we have, but this gives you a really good review. So here we go. In this practical, a bomb calorimeter will be used to determine the heats of combustion of liquids. The apparatus consists of a bomb, show, and a calorimeter. Once disassembled, you can see the bomb consists of two sidearms and a crucible. The sidearms have sleeves and a fuse wire can be fed through a hole in the sidearms and clamped in place with the sleeves. A piece of cotton is then tied to the fuse wire and fed into the crucible, and the liquid sample then added to the crucible. 
when run, a high sprint is passed through the side arms. Sorry about that, everyone. So I just wanted to pause for a minute. Our bomb calorimeter has the same setup where we have the little crucible and there's an ignition wire going across and you have to tie that little piece of string of cotton that goes from the ignition wire down to your food sample because the ignition wire is what's going to be put on fire and that little piece of cotton is the way in which that ignition is transferred from the ignition wire to the food sample. They're showing you a liquid sample in lab, in person, we would be using a peanut. This will cause the fuse wire to burn through, igniting the cotton, and the cotton leading into the crucible will ignite the sample. Once assembled, the bomb needs to be pressurized to 8 bar with oxygen. We do the same thing in our lab. Um, the apparatus looks a little bit different, but I'm going to ask you to think about why is it that we have to add oxygen? What is it that we need oxygen for? Okay, remembering how the bomb calorimeter is set up and that we're burning the food sample. The calorimeter is now assembled. A can of water is inserted. The can plus its contents weigh exactly three kilos. The assembled and pressurized bomb is then inserted in the can. So our calorimeter doesn't have a, uh, a can. Instead, the water is put into a little spout and the water fills around the opening, you, the big opening you see here. But the idea is gonna be the same. We set that bomb, we set that sealed chamber inside the unit and as the food burns, it'll give off heat and it'll change the temperature of the water surrounding it. The lid of the calorimeter is closed. The stirrer turned on. And the black button at the center of the calorimeter pushed down. If a good contact is made, it will stay down once pressed. Once the ready light on the calorimeter has come on, the apparatus can then be fired by pressing and holding the fire button. Once fired, the temperature should be monitored every minute until it stops rising. At this point, the... So in our calorimeter, you do indeed press an ignition button um, however, we don't have to manually keep track. Our unit is set up to automatically give us a temperature reading of the surrounding water every minute for seven minutes. And at the end of that seven minutes, the unit is done and it's going to spit out to us a number. Pretty cool. As I said, uh, these go for about $10,000 and that style bomb calorimeter is what facilities use to actually find out how many calories a food contains to put on the nutrition label. One last difference I want to point out between, well, one last thing I want to point out, excuse me. When we finish with the bomb calorimeter in lab, I'm able to take out that sealed bomb, the sealed canister. I'm able to release the oxygen inside and then I unscrew the lid and we take out that little crucible. And what we find is nothing, absolutely nothing. So the bomb calorimeter is designed to completely combust the food. Think about how this relates to our homemade calorimeter and how one or the other makes these more or less accurate. All right, here are the results, okay? Using the bomb calorimeter, we can see the initial weights were put in, and then the final weights are all zero. As I just said, the bomb calorimeter is set up to completely combust the food, so we're able to burn it all and get an idea of how much food it gives off, how much heat it gives off in total. More importantly, on the right are the number of calories per gram. As we can see from the bomb calorimeter, the peanut has the most calories per gram, and the popcorn has the least. I wonder how this compares to the numbers we got for the homemade calorimeter 
and how this compares to what your hypotheses were. In talking about the peanut, I think it's, excuse me, I think it's fun to take a minute and relate this to the um, actual nutrition label that we get. So let me go back for a second. So using the bomb calorimeter, it found that a peanut contains 6.9 calories per gram. So let's, let's do a little bit of math just to compare. So through the bomb calorimeter, we found that the peanut contains 6.9 calories per gram. So what if we wanted to compare our results to an actual nutrition label? It requires a little bit of math, but we can do it. And I'm going to put in black the results of our bomb calorimeter, and then I'll put in blue. Let's do green. I'll do green, the results of the nutrition label, right? Nutrition label in green. So here we see that according to this, there's 160 calories per one ounce. So the nutrition label is telling us there's 160 calories per ounce. This is nice enough to show us how many grams are in an ounce. Not every nutrition label does that. So if every one ounce is equal to 28 grams, we can do the math. So we can say 160 calories divided by 28 grams gives us 5.7 calories per gram. So here is our comparison. The bomb calorimeter said that a peanut contains 6.9 calories per gram, whereas a nutrition label tells us that the, the Frito-Lay peanut salted in shell contain 5.7 calories per gram. Why are they different? Well, they're relatively close. So they're in within 1.2 calories per gram. When we think about these nutritive calories, they're, it's a very uh, small unit. So this is to be expected. We could also just think, you know, if we measured a different peanut from the bunch, we might get a slightly different number. If we think about peanuts that are grown in the earth, they probably, they, not every peanut that comes out of the ground is the same exact consistency, weight. There's just some natural variation. So we had to understand that these are nature made and they're going to have some natural variation. Are these numbers very close? Yes, they are. All right, good stuff. Now, you have all the values you need to be able to compare our results from the homemade calorimeter to the bomb calorimeter. And from this, you'll be able to answer any questions that we ask of you. So, as I just said, we are all done here. Now it's going to be up to you. Now the fun begins. Um, along with this lab video and PowerPoint are going to be some questions for you to answer. Good luck.